Did you ever hear of Kong? Why, yes. Some native superstition, isn't it? A god or a spirit or something. Well, anyway, neither beast nor man. Something monstrous, all-powerful, still living, still holding that island in a grip of deadly fear. Well, every legend has a basis of truth. Welcome to Now Playing's King Kong Retrospective Series. I'm offering him adventure, fame, the thrill of a lifetime, and a long sea voyage. Well, I don't see how you can be amused by gorillas. I think they're dull. Well, this one's 60 feet tall. What do you think of him? 60 feet? That's right. This is Kong, the strongest living creature on Earth. Hosted by Stuart. I, I, I was just afraid that you might be one of those self-obsessed literary types. Mm -hmm. The Tweety Twerp with his nose in this book. Jacob. I'm on the level. No funny business. Trust me and keep your chin up. And Arnie. Here we are. Just one big happy family. This podcast may contain detailed plot spoilers and mild language. Are you sure about this? we primates too. Listener discretion is advised. It's time to show Kong that man is king. We hope you enjoy the show. Lights, cameras, Kong! Today we're discussing King Kong, starring Fay Ray, Robert Armstrong, Bruce Cabot, directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shodasek. This is Arnie, co-host of this crazy voyage to Skull Island. And Stuart. I was a king and a god in the world I knew, but now I come to now playing merely a co-host. This is Jacob. Come on, Jacob, you're not that much of a god. Otherwise, you would move the movie where we're building up to back to its original time place <laughs> in March 2020. We thought we were building up to Godzilla vs. Kong. Well, we are. The 60s one. <laughs> and we will. We'll cover it when it comes out now, slated for November 2020, almost a year from now. But up till then... Yeah, this is, I think, an important podcast anyway, because it is the oldest movie by far, by decades, now playing as ever touched. Not even in the book did we get this far back. Yeah, I mean, I don't know it, many people alive that were there to have seen the movie when it came out in 1933. Why are we reviewing such an old movie? I mean, other than film students, do a lot of people go back to the 30s and watch these films? I don't, and I'm a film student. I rarely make it back to the 1930s. For me, movies became real, alive, something I could connect to more in the 40s, the 50s, certainly 60s, 70s Hollywood is where I find I can still find a lot of relevance. It hurts my feelings when you say, oh, that movie is so old. When you say a movie from 1933 is so old, I'll go, yep, it is. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. <laughs> Yeah, don't have kids then, Stuart, because every movie is old when you have kids, and they let you know, why are you watching this old movie? I'm like, it came out 10 years ago. Yeah, it doesn't have a modern sensibility. Beyond it, the fact that it's black and white with antiquated special effects technology, it is shot and conceived in a world that is not modern. And so, yeah, it is a time capsule. Without a doubt, a certain interest you're going to have in it is what it says about the times in which it was made, 86 years ago. I always wonder when it comes to old movies like this, because it's going to happen with the movies of today. 50 years from now, not everybody's going to remember hidden figures and fences and 21 bridges. Certain films are going to stand the test of time and certain films aren't. I don't understand why Citizen Kane and this and Casablanca are films that stand the test of time, whereas so many others of the time don't. What makes these stand out? You can argue some of it is quality. Citizen Kane and Casablanca are still some of the best movies I've ever seen of any time period. But before we talk about what Kong is and what he did do, I'd like to just point out what he didn't. Because I think you might think with it being so old that he did a lot of firsts he doesn't earn. 
I did. And when I watched this movie, I'm like, <laughs> was this the first special effects picture? And then I'm like, well, no, I... No, there's silent movies that use special effects. 1902, okay? <laughs> 1902 stage magician Jorge Milai is taking us on a trip to the moon and using stop motion photography. Oh, I saw that on a making of Star Wars thing. Yeah, where the rocket ship pokes the moon in the eye. Yeah, and it cries. There's like a whole chorus line of like rockets when you finally get to the yes. moon. It's, it's a wonderful <laughs> device. I love it, actually. I think it's been colorized and you could even set music to it. And it's a wonderful visual. And so 1902, people were instantly, again, many stage musicians were thinking, how can I use this as my latest trick? I think film has always been thought of as a special effect. And so, no, this was by far, by decades beyond the first time anybody was using stop motion effects. It is also not the first movie to have a prehistoric monster rampage in a downtown city. 1925 silent movie based on Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lost World. It was about a whole expedition that found dinosaurs still living on a tropical island. A brontosaurus comes back and runs all through London and destroys a few windows before he falls off the bridge. I've actually seen that one. I was really young. I lived in Florida where a lot of old people live. They showed a lot of really old movies, and that was on one morning. And I just couldn't look away from those stop motion effects. There was something cute. Yes. Yeah. No, this isn't even the first Ray Harryhausen film, which I thought it was. But no, it's just the film that inspired him to do stop motion. Yeah. Ray Harryhausen did not work on this film. It's not the first movie to use an ape as a villain. It was a popular conceit. Five years before, made both as a silent movie and remade as a talkie was this murder mystery called the gorilla so audiences again had thought of leading men that were apes it is not even the most popular film of 1933 it came in at number five the number one film is a movie i bet no one remembers cavalcade it won best picture and i bet you not a person on earth can even name one frame of it now and the thing that gets me about King Kong lasting is that I would have thought it was based on a book or something. Because when I look at movies, franchise films from olden days, pre-World War II that hold up, I think of things like Tarzan. But that was based on pulp novels. Right. And Flash Gordon and comic books. Yeah, you think of everything being adapted. Certainly everything with a popular folklore kind of creature has some precedence of something that came before but no yeah king kong is an original concept and why why does an original concept from 1933 loom this large when we already had big special effects movies movies that made more money you look at the big stars of the 1930s shirley temple sonia heine she was an ice skater that was huge W.C. Fields was a drunk that hated kids. <laughs> Again, Flash Gordon, he was a big box office star. None of those people carry any weight now. There's nobody that's talking about remaking Shirley Temple. So why Kong? I got a theory. Here it is. It's a two-parter. Because he climbed the Empire State Building. That is why we remember him. And that is significant for two reasons. One... The Empire State Building was new. <laughs> it was brand new and had just opened at that time. And it meant something to see the most modern structure in the world be reclaimed by something from Earth's prehistoric past. That is symbolic of something. And two, Kong did it for the ladies. It was out of the love of a blonde woman and it cost him his life. In a weird kind of way, I think Kong is a doomed love story, kind of like Romeo and Juliet. I got a lot of hunchback of Notre Dame from this, too. I mean, you said it's an original movie, but the more I thought about The Lost World and Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's not an original movie. It's a derivative movie, but it's not based on anything specifically. It's not an adaptation. It's a synthesis. Right. And Stuart, I will agree that Empire State Building has everything to do with it. When I was thinking back about Kong, because we're building up to him facing off versus probably the most famous giant monster. Maybe it's debatable if that's King Kong or Godzilla. But like, I think about Godzilla, like Japanese, they, like they have all the kaiju. They have all the giant monsters that are cool. Like the only other one outside of Japan, we have Kong. 
but he's not even from America. He was brought here from an island, but it's because of that Empire State Building. That's why they reclaim him as American, because he climbed up that building in New York, and there is something that feels very American about that. Yeah, and you know what? I would say when I think about my history with this character, I was always in the camp Godzilla. Those were the films that were on when I was a kid. Actually, the 1977 King Kong remake ran on cable a lot, and I never watched it because my family told me it was a really bad film, and so I just ignored it. I never even saw that film in its entirety. Maybe a clip here or there. I watched the Japanese throw down Kong versus Godzilla, and I was always rooting for Godzilla. We were supposed to care about Kong because he was the American. It was some kind of nationalist kind of fight. <laughs> but for me, Godzilla looked cool. Who cares about an ape? That's nothing special. Godzilla was a mutant. He was green. He could breathe fire. And it was almost like a dinosaur. So he was more mythic. Therefore, you had to think of him as being the real king. I have a really embarrassing story to tell. Growing up, I watched King Kong a lot. The 1970s version. Okay, I was going to say, really? <laughs> All right, yeah, I couldn't see you watching black and white. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. This is the one I watched as a kid was this original one. King Kong was on TV, and I watched it when I was single digits, kindergarten age or so. And then a couple years later, we got a VCR. They aired King Kong on television. I taped it. I watched it again and again. I always cried when the ape died at the end. I was into that movie. Later, people would be talking about King Kong and how it's a really old movie. I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, 70s. <laughs> I went to college and took a lot of film classes and watched a lot of old movies. Birth of a Nation, The Great Train Robbery, you know, this type of film. Never once did anyone bring up there was a King Kong. And then 2005, okay? I am 31 years old. <laughs> wow. It took that long? Really? <laughs> it took Peter Jackson to make you realize that this was an old 30s movie. Peter Jackson is making King Kong, and I'm like, okay, a remake of the 70s film. I'm down. And he's fighting dinosaurs. I'm like, wait, there were no dinosaurs in King Kong. <laughs> and I get thinking about it. I had seen footage of King Kong, the 30s film. I think it was in like a Skittles ad or some television ad showed the ape on the Empire State Building taking swipes at biplanes. I thought that was a cheap recreation of the 70s movie with television level special effects. It wasn't until they started doing bonus features and internet advertising for Peter Jackson's King Kong that suddenly a bell went off. I'm like... You mean the 70s one isn't the original? <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I would hope you would have realized it by then. That's the last time I probably watched this 1933 one is in 2005 when the Jackson one was coming out. They started playing that original one over and over on cable TV. So that's the last time I rewatched this one. Yeah, I have never seen this one. Never. You never, like, caught up with it, even once you found out that there's an older one than the 70s. I never saw Peter Jackson's either. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have gone and watched older films. That 100 Movie Challenge had King Kong on it. It was the third oldest film. The General and Intolerance were the only two films older than King Kong, and we were talking about doing King Kong last year, so I kind of held off on watching that one, and I'm finally getting to it now. Yeah, I probably did eventually see the original sometime as a teenager when you're too cool for school and it would never mean anything to you. So I'm the only one that has like childhood memories of watching stop motion King Kong fighting dinosaurs and just being blown away. My childhood was playing Donkey Kong and I did love that. I mean, yeah, you want to talk about an ape standing at the top of a building with a woman all the time. Jump over the barrels and get them. Yeah, I definitely love that game and I love that concept. But all the ones that came when I was of age to pay attention to what I was consuming would have been like King Kong Lives. My memories of that are not good. I haven't seen any of these other ones besides the Peter Jackson one. I've watched this original one, again, a bunch of times when I was a kid, and then, again, when the Peter Jackson one came out, I don't know anything. That 70s one, Arnie, that's new to me. See, in the 70s one, the original Kong vs. Godzilla and the recent Kong Skull Island are the only three I've seen. But I was firmly on Kong's side in that one because I'd watched that 70s film so often. I mean, that's the only reason I watched King Kong vs. Godzilla was it was a monster mash with two monsters I knew, one I knew well, and that was Kong. 
And Peter Jackson, you know, I made the mistake of going opening weekend to a midnight show. It was a literal, you had to be there at 12. It's a very long movie. Yeah, you got home at 6 in the morning the next day. <laughs> if the ape didn't scream so loudly so often, I would have fallen asleep. It was li- I literally remember it like an alarm clock. Like it just kept going <laughs> off when I was trying to shut off my eyes. So I don't really remember it well other than it feeling like it went on eternally. And I did see Skull Island, and I remember thinking that it was a charming evocation, not really so much of 1933 Kong, but of 1979 Apocalypse Now. But that's what I liked about it, not the ape. Again, I've never really been attracted to this character other than the video game. So how did this character come to be if he's not from a book? If he isn't somebody that Tarzan knew from Edgar Rice Burroughs? I think we have to talk about the man that conceived him, or gets credit for that, Mirian Cooper. Do you guys know this guy? Nope. (laughs) I learned about him. I did listen to the commentary for this. I did some research, but I'd never heard his name before that moment. Yeah, he is kind of like Howard Hughes mixed with P.T. Barnum. Like he has an incredible life story that is worthy of a movie. He grew up like a lot of kids of his generation at the turn of the 20th century, reading stories about the Dark Continent. You know, all these explorers that go to Africa or the Far East, the Orient, you know, it's still, <laughs> they were Orientals still back then. And you would hear these adventure tales. And so you signed up for the military to see the world. And that guy did everything. I mean, he chased Pancho Villa in Mexico. He flew planes in World War I. He joined Poland in driving out the Bolsheviks during a Soviet invasion. I got the feeling the director in this movie was very autobiographical. And completely, yes. He will even even looks like him. They cast someone that looks like Miriam Cooper. It is his story. He eventually, in all his travels, partners with a war photographer named Ernest Shodasak, and that is the co-director of this movie. But it really is Cooper's concept. He is the creator of Kong, and Ernest was given the camera and basically told, you direct the actors, I'll come up with the big ideas. So they had a lot of, like, a whole eight years of making movies before they make King Kong. They would go off, as you see this director in this movie, hey, let's just go off to a far-off dangerous jungle and start shooting real tigers and elephants and stampedes and see what happens. And they would bring back incredible footage that a very skilled editor would turn into an actual movie. And so, yeah, they had been, by this point, to Iran, India, the jungles of Thailand, and they had spent a whole year in these jungles where there were all of these apes. And Cooper eventually one day said, hey, look at that ape. Wouldn't it be amazing if he started killing white people? Let's make a movie about that. And that is kind of where it started. Specifically white people? Like you wanted that ape to go crazy on white folks? Well, I mean, I, you know, he is white. Shodasak is white. They consider themselves. He never used the word white. Their documentaries featured indigenous people. They didn't insert white characters per se to make it relatable to Hollywood audiences. But yes, if you're going to go work in Hollywood. I can't imagine it was up to our standards of racial sensitivity today, but this movie isn't. It does sound interesting just going out into the jungle and filming stuff and then working it into your film. Also, just other things that you can see as influences, Marion Cooper had a day job. When he wasn't off risking his life in the jungle to make these documentaries, he was running the new airline Pan Am. And his office was located down the street from this construction site you might have heard of, erecting the tallest building in the world. He had a front row seat for watching the Empire State Building being built. So there it is. There's his idea literally going up right in front of his face. And... The other idea that probably comes in and helps complete the picture is when you're going off to the jungle and hanging out with other explorers, you make a lot of friends with scientists. And he became best buds with the guy who discovered a species of prehistoric lizard known as the Komodo dragon. He was there in Indonesia, and he's like, let's bring him to the Bronx. (laughs) And so they brought all of these lizards to the Bronx, and the Komodo dragons didn't do so good. Yeah, they're very aggressive and mean. Did they eat anyone? Uh, Apparently, it was everything. The client, they couldn't get the food right, and they all died. So it was seen as this effort to bring a prehistoric creature to New York that ended with them dying. We get it, right? We see the whole picture of why this idea eventually comes into Miriam Cooper's head. And after making several successful pictures and just being so larger than life, someone at Paramount says, 
No, <laughs> this is way too expensive, people. It's the Great Depression. How much is this going to cost me to make your, quote, terror ape picture? <laughs> like, originally, Cooper just wanted to make it a regular ape. And in fact, proposed he would go to the jungle and capture it himself. And they would drag it and have it fight real Komodo dragon. Oh. Now, if I were the studio executive, I'd have greenlit that just so he'd go and die trying to capture the gorilla. <laughs> was the plan to still, like, use rear screen projection so the people would look little? Or was it just going to be a normal sized ape? Normal ape is scary enough. And again, there have been several movies. The gorilla had a murder mystery. Spoiler alert. The killer is the gorilla at the end of the gorilla. So I have seen that and it is hysterical. <laughs> so anyway, so again, they saw commercial ideas in it, but most studios just didn't have the money. First of all, they just weren't going to bring live apes to the Paramount Studios, nor were they going to let him take expensive cameras and actors that needed to be insured out into real jungles to film it there. It had to be done on a soundstage. And how do you do that on a budget that's economical in 1930 when a very expensive movie cost $200,000? Like that is just breaking the bank. And the smallest estimate for what this would cost is half a million. And in fact, King Kong ends up costing 700000 So three times the biggest movie that had ever been made. And is that because of the special effects we're going to discuss? You could have thrown someone, I guess, in a monkey suit and had them stomp around like they would have Godzilla destroy downtown Tokyo. But is that what drove the cost up, that they're going with this stop motion stuff? And why did they not use a person in a suit? I just assumed I would be seeing a person in a suit for some shots here. I knew there was stop motion. I couldn't believe it was all puppet and stop motion. Cooper didn't want to do that, but he was coming to the conclusion he had no other option. If I can't go get the ape... And as the story evolved and it was thought that bigger is better, you know, as usually is his instinct, why don't we make it taller? Why don't we make it 18 feet tall? There's no other way to do that in 1930 than to get somebody in a suit. But as it so happens, one executive from Paramount decides to defect. David Selznick says, I'm going to go form my own studio and creates RKO Pictures and because he remembers the pitch from Cooper, thinks this will be a great film to put RKO on the map. It's kind of like an icon. Like, this will be the same thing that the woman at the beginning of a Columbia Pictures movie will be. Everyone will know RKO because we have this big ape, and I like Cooper. We're going to make it somehow. And they had already been in production with a dinosaur movie. The guy that made The Lost World with the brontosaurus that terrorized London had been spending almost $200,000 on test footage to make another dinosaur movie. And everyone there, not only did they know it was going to cost over a million dollars, nobody really liked the movie. It was all, it kind of sounded like Land of the Lost. If you remember that, it was like a whole family that gets lost on a dinosaur island. And nobody thought it was going to be that commercial. And it was going to cost 10 times more than any movie ever made. So they decided, let's scrap that. It left a lot of stop motion animators with nothing to do at RKO at a time when Cooper is invited to come over and come up with an idea on how to make a big ape. So one plus one equals two. Suddenly the animators start peeling off the covering on their puppets and start putting on ape puppets. And yeah, it's the first time that stop motion is being asked to be the leading man. It had been done before, but that Brano attack at the end of Lost World was only about five minutes. And here you now have a main character that needs to have several scenes where they're giving a performance. Can that be done? That was kind of the pressure that was being put on them. And so, yeah, no one had any experience with using stop motion on this level and there are plenty of stories about how they filmed a whole sequence in the jungle and didn't realize a flower had bloomed like during the shot that they couldn't use it because literally like a big flower <laughs> opened up while Kong walked by and I mean that might have been kind of cool but not realistic so it was a struggle to make this movie they had to find a studio that was willing to have cash and spend the cash at a time when movie studios didn't have a lot of cash to blow on big movies so it was a gamble that obviously paid off how much money did it make? In its initial run, it grossed about $5 million. And, like, opening day, it, it like, $90,000. They had two theaters. 1933, $5 million, or $5 million today? <laughs> yeah, it would have been about $5 million then. That was a beyond big blockbuster. 
I mean, seeing that someone's going to complain about a $20 ticket in this film, yeah, $5 million would be a ton of money back then. Yeah, but keep in mind, initial runs meant it probably ran all year long. And again, these movie palaces, they were huge. I mean, they'd have 10,000 seats sometimes, and you could show a 90-minute movie 10 times a day. So, Great Depression, people aren't working, it only cost a nickel to go to a movie. Yeah, these things can reap those kinds of profits. But also keep in mind, Kong isn't just about an initial theatrical run. There's no television. Nobody can go home and stream at pay-per-view. This movie would come back five times in the next 10 years. It actually was called the movie of the year in 1952 because it was having such an influence. (laughs) Like it continued to dominate moviegoers' minds for decades in theaters. Yeah, I did notice they got a lot of re-releases, and it seems like every time they would re-release it in the theaters, they'd cut a little bit more out of it. Well, yeah, that's the interesting thing. 1933 is an important year, because one year later, there's the Hayes Codes, and people started cracking down for the first time about what you could show and not show in an American-released movie. Before to that point, I mean, a lot of people talk about pre-code movies having a lot of saucy language, even nudity, and... I could not believe it. One time I was watching... Watching an old Tarzan. And I'm like, this is really cheesy. The next thing I know, Tarzan is surrounded by naked women, and there's a woman <laughs> underwater, full frontal nudity. I'm like, what the hell, Tarzan, is this? <laughs> yes. I mean, come on, you're going to have Kong peeling off Fay Ray's clothes here and sniffing his finger. It's crazy. If this movie had been made in 1934, we would have never seen that. But because it is 1933, all of that footage remains. You'll even notice there were some scenes that were cut just because Fay Ray is never wearing a bra. And it just became too obvious at certain points with her fully clothed, she's still not wearing a bra. And so cut one scene of her just standing on the boat because of that reason. Violence and sexual content standards were different at this time. As the movie got re-released, yeah, it got shorter. I remember this movie being like 80 minutes long. I was like, oh yeah, it's not that long. I was surprised to see the full run was one hour, 44 minutes, including a musical overture. Yeah, that's the version I saw. It was put out on a collector's edition Blu-ray. Looked great. Yeah, and most of the footage has been recollected from the initial run. I think we feel like we have the complete movie, but there are things that have been lost. We'll talk about it as we go through what got trimmed and, the, of course, the big famous scene that some will argue was there initially and it cannot be found anywhere now. But in order to do that, why don't we get a plot first? Robert Armstrong plays famed wildlife movie director Carl Denham, going overseas for his latest picture. Audiences told him to put a dame in the movie, so he's trying to find an actress, but none will go due to his dangerous filming techniques. Desperate, he finds the impoverished Anne Darrow, played by Faye Ray, and hires her to star in his film. They set sail the next morning on a boat, no commercial airlines back then, I guess, and during the voyage, Anne falls for the ship's first mate, John Driscoll, Played by Bruce Cabot. Is it John or is it Jack? You know, it's credited as John, but they call him Jack. It's John on IMDb, but in the movie they always called him Jack. Correct. It's very confusing. It turns out Denim has led the crew to an island not on any map that is rumored to have monstrous creatures. When they arrive on the island, the natives there are holding a ceremony offering a girl of their tribe up to be the Bride of Kong. Which would have been a better title for this, I'm just going to say. Yeah, how do we not have a Bride of Kong movie? (laughs) We'll talk about it. The chief says the stranger's interruption ruined the ceremony, and they want to offer Anne up to their god, but Denim refuses and the crew returns to the ship. The natives follow them back to the ship and kidnap Anne, taking her behind a giant wall and tying her up. Then Kong appears, a 40-foot gorilla. Kong takes Anne into the jungle. Driscoll, Denim, and the others go to rescue Anne, and on the island they discover dinosaurs and other giant monsters. Between Kong and the monsters, most of the men are killed. Anne is also attacked by giant beasts, but Kong fights and kills them all, defending his blonde bride. Eventually, Driscoll reaches Anne and saves her, and while Kong gives chase, Denim knocks out the giant ape with a gas bomb. With dollar signs in his eyes, Denim takes Kong back to New York City to be his new attraction, dubbed the Eighth Wonder of the World. He has a gala premiere night filled with press to unveil Kong to the modern city, but the flashbulbs of the press irritate Kong and he breaks his chrome steel chains. Chrome steel chains he breaks. I want to... Amazing. He's strong. Did you do some research on that? Because I want to know what chrome steel is. (laughs) I thought it was just shiny. Anne and Driscoll, now engaged, were at the premiere, 
but Kong grabs Anne and climbs to the top of the Empire State Building. The ape is attacked by airplanes and shot, and Kong falls to his death. While Driscoll helps Anne down from the roof, and Denim ignores all the bullet holes in the big gorilla and says, "'Tis beauty killed the beast," and credits roll. Yeah, and he says that as they start, too. There's some apocryphal Arab proverb that is not real. <laughs> Cooper just made that up on the spot. No Arab <laughs> has ever said this thing that this movie begins with. But yeah, they want to sell this message that they're drawing from fairy tales and Beauty and the Beast. I did think it was strange that Arabians talked like the Bible. And lo, the beast looked upon him. Like, is this Genesis or is this Arab text? <laughs> Yeah, I always thought that last line about why the beast died was like the big stinger, but they foreshadowed that so much. They got this Arabian proverb, and then Denim's going to say it a couple times throughout the film. And what does that do? Well, it's really, it puts a spotlight on something that I never really think about in King Kong. We all know Faye Ray. I mean, I think her whole theme is that she is a screen queen. She was in several horror movies that year. I think she did 11 films the year she made King Kong, including the first Wax Museum movie. And she did Dr. X and something with a vampire as well. Like, she was getting that reputation. And suddenly we are to think of this more as her movie. At least she's the inspiration for what's going to kill Kong when in fact I never think about it that way in my mind when I think about Kong I think about those airplanes shooting at him and also it's beginning with four minutes of music the overture that would be playing while the curtain was still down at the movie palace and getting people queued up into the mood of watching a big epic movie for me I'll just go ahead and say Max Steiner has written many memorable scores including Gone with the Wind this music feels appropriate it rarely feels memorable. I can't hum it. I always feel like it's speaking to the moment. Oh, it's a lighthearted romance. Let's have some violin. We're <laughs> here at the village. We need to have some bongos. But I don't feel like Kong has a theme. There's not a lot of music in this picture until they get to Kong, really. Kong, I felt, had a theme in that music played when Kong was around. I like the music in the overture, but you're right. I mean, on two watchings of this film, I can't hum it. Yeah, I was going to say, can you hum it? Because I watched about 30 seconds of this overture, and if this was a catchy little tune, I probably would have sat through all four minutes, but I hit that forward button. Let's get to the actual movie. Yeah, Gone with the Wind. Da, na, na, na. I'll never forget that. Here, again, I watched this movie twice for this recording. I don't know the notes. I did watch the overture mainly because I wanted to seep myself in. If the movie was there to give me this to start setting a mood, I was going to let it set that mood. And then when we get into the story, the actual characters, the first person we meet is someone we really don't need to pay attention to. He is just a device to announce that a ship is leaving New York Harbor that's supposed to be about making a motion picture, but is actually full of guns and bombs and explosives and could actually blow up all of New York if somebody threw a cigarette in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think this is a pretty grabby opening. Like, okay, this is an old-fashioned movie, but yeah, you hear about this crazy ship with a huge crew and gas bombs. Um, I thought this was about making a jungle picture, but it sounds like a war movie almost. There's something about all the secrecy going around with Denim and his plan to shoot his latest picture that kind of grabs me and keeps me interested to find out what's going on. And I'm just marveling at the obvious storytelling devices going on here. Oh, they're mentioning gas bombs. Gas bombs are going to become important. All of this exposition is just there to set up what's going to happen later. Oh yeah, of course there's that. But I also, I think it's an interesting way to characterize artistic endeavor. I make movies that require bombs <laughs> and like people will shut me down. I could destroy New York with my vision. Seems to be a really interesting way to characterize Carl Denham, who is, in my mind, ultimately the real central character of this film. He is the guy that kills Kong. It is not beauty that kills the beast. It is a guy who believes he can go into a jungle because someone handed him a hand-drawn map. <laughs> like some Norwegian sailor drunk said, hey, we picked up some villagers once in a canoe. They all died, but they told me they lived at this island and it's full of giant beasts. I want to go to that island, so I'm going to follow this drawing <laughs> like it's a real map from Rand McNally and then try to put a camera in front of the said beast and see what it does. From this opening scene, I am taking Denim as a villain, as the, perhaps, villain of this film. Everybody's talking about how dangerous it is, and 
maybe this is me, you know, 21st century person, but the way he talks about flappers and dames and he doesn't want any on, why can't you have romance without flappers? I'm thinking this guy is an asshole who's going to put everybody in jeopardy. He will be Kong's triumph. This man will not survive the film, is my belief here. Yeah, you would believe that he deserves everything that he's going to get here. But to come to that conclusion is not to know about the person actually directing Kong. Again, Kong is being directed by two people, Cooper and Shodasak. Shodasak's wife actually is one of the last people to have her hand on the script, and she just filled it with autobiographical details. She met her husband while they were traveling to the Galapagos Island. She is the one dame on a ship full of brutal sailors who has seen all kinds of lion attacks. And every story you hear reference here, rhino charges and the cameraman won't do it, that happened. This has been their life for the last decade. And so Carl is going to portray himself as the hero. He will never see himself as the villain here. Yeah, I just didn't expect it. Again, I had the 70s movie very clearly in my mind as well. So I thought I knew where this was going to go. And this guy is pretty irredeemable. He is going to put people in danger time and again in exchange for his vision. Is that irredeemable or just someone that knows how to have a good time? The difference between like an asshole and like the life of the party is whether anyone dies, right? I mean, usually like the best party is when the house caught on fire and the guns went off and the ape ran through, but nobody died. (laughs) If anyone gets hurt, you're a criminal. But if no one gets hurt, you're the best party thrower of all time. So I think that's the chemistry here as Denim has the potential to destroy everyone on this ship because he has an artistic vision that even he is not entirely sure about. But I guess maybe because I worked in Hollywood and I love people that follow their dreams and don't do the practical thing, I'm kind of hoping that he succeeds. And I think it's hilarious that he hasn't thought about adding a girl until the last minute. It's a calculation of like, oh yeah, we need a little bit of this to help sell the picture after I make the movie that I want. He's going to run out the night before the ship leaves the dock. It's another reason why I thought he'd die. The way he says, can't we have romance without flappers? I thought this was a coded message that he was gay, and I'm positive in the 30s, gay meant dead. Right, no, well, I was looking at him very much in that way. I would actually say that he's very passionate, but it's about calm. His love affair is for Kong. It is not for the woman. He, he never sees her. Even later when she's in her sexy dress and he's cranking that camera, some people would use that as a euphemism for, oh, he's getting his rocks off. I never get any sense of attraction Carl Denham has for Faye Ray's character. He just knows what will look good on camera. Again, all he cares about is his own vision. And so, yeah, he's going to prowl around New York. They could actually tease this out a little bit more. It would be kind of fun to see a few scenes of him screen testing ladies on the street. Just wait till 2005. Peter Jackson makes everything longer. (laughs) Yeah, and I think that we spend too much time getting to the island. I do not want any more scenes with women who are not going to be in the movie. In this movie, you feel it takes too long? I don't think it takes too long to set sail. I think it takes too long to get to the island. So I wouldn't want to add anything before the island. Okay, before the island or before Kong? Because it'll take 46 minutes to get to Kong, but only about 25 to get to the island. Before Kong. Yeah, I didn't realize 46 minutes to get to Kong because I feel like there's stuff I'm into during this journey. Like, Yeah, I think it's funny that, oh, we got to find a woman. I don't know if Anne's homeless, but I guess she's trying to steal an apple. She's hungry. It is the Great Depression. Yeah, I put homeless in my plot summary first draft and then realized... You know, I'm not positive she's homeless, but she is destitute. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. With the time period, everyone would understand she's down on her luck. At the very least, you live day by day not knowing where you're going to get your next meal. And I'm so glad that there's a next scene because I was afraid, literally, it would cut from her falling unconscious in Denim's arm (laughs) to her waking up on the boat, finding out she's his leading lady. At least she gets asked if she wants to come and even given a cup of coffee before she decides to hop on the boat. Yeah, it did feel like a little bit of kidnapping. And I do like the scene where she's standing by the boat. We meet the first mate who's going to be her love interest by him accidentally punching her in the face. That's a meat cute for the ages. I had to rewind that scene. I'm like, did he just hit her in the face? <laughs> Even more rich, 
This is the stand-in for the other co-director, Ernst Schodesack. This is apparently what he looks like, what he acts like, written by his wife. So she's been punched by him. Yes, <laughs> she is identifying as Anne, trying to get on this ship with these burly men. And admittedly, it was bad luck in sailor terms to have women on the boat. I mean, that goes back to days of piracy. Right. It was a different time, to gender equality, all of that. I think we should be able to set aside all of that and put, isn't it interesting that this was the dominant cultural beliefs of that time and not attack the movie for having those views? Agreed. But what I'm impressed with the film doing is they do make her competent because I would have expected from the way they were reacting my go-to was Willie in Indiana Jones sure. and the Temple of Doom. Yeah, I definitely thought about Willie. Willie is an attempt to do Fay Ray. Ooh, a poor one. <laughs> <laughs> the way Willie was always just screwing up and focused on beauty and men and all the wrong things. At one point here, we're going to have Anne say, I've not been a problem. Look, there's going to be a long stretch from when Fay Ray is tied up till when she gets back to New York, where I don't think she does anything but scream. I don't think she has any lines of dialogue. But for this stuff on the ship, yeah, she's holding her own. It doesn't feel like that damsel in distress that you might expect in a 30s motion picture. I agree. I won't go so far as to say I like Fay Ray in this picture. There's not enough of her to characterize it. Yeah, there's no character here. She has some of the spunk that you expect to see of females in screwball comedies of that time. Usually when you see a romantic picture, they're spitballs, you know, like they got a lot of attitude. They do steal things and pickpocket and they're not traditional, passive, submissive housewives. They typically live outside the parameters of what society deems acceptable in 1930s. And so that's kind of how it blooms here. She's going to have a shipboard romance with Jack Driscoll in which, you know, oh, I hate you until I love you. Like it only takes a beat to go from one extreme to the other. Which is... Again, from so many films of that era, that does seem to be the evolution. And, you know, it kind of goes back to that trope. Strong feelings of one type can mask strong feelings of another. But it's on the boat that I do realize Fay Ray deserves top billing. Because I was shocked when you open a film with a film director and he is the one who is propelling the action... I did think Driscoll was going to be the star of this film, and I wondered why Fay Ray got top billing on the boat. Driscoll kind of disappears. I feel like everyone kind of disappears. There's not a whole lot of characters here. And when we get to 2005, I think Jackson, that was on his mind. And we can talk about if the way he took it was successful. But more or less everyone here are just props for when we get to the giant gorilla. Like, I don't feel I'm ever invested in this relationship between Driscoll and and That's not what this movie cares about. Yeah, there's so many crewmen here who get funny one-liners as they go along and... They're staring at her from the crow's nest and things. But yeah, they never come back. I thought they would be the Greek choir or something throughout the rest of the film. They're gorilla fodder. Yeah, but here's what I would argue that it makes Denim more interesting. Because everything that's going to happen here with Anne, he's going to do the same thing to the ape. His treatment of his leading lady is the same as his treatment of his leading man. And so if you look at this as a story about artistic endeavor and the extremes that a movie director will go to punish his cast and crew to achieve his vision, I guess I'm putting a lot of that in because of my experience in Hollywood. And But I find that really rich. To me, it's very sustaining to see all of these early scenes. I actually wanted more of it. I actually wanted Denim to kind of play Cupid and kind of push his leading lady into liking this guy who, quite frankly, I think a reason why we don't spend a lot of time on Driscoll is the actor is no good at all <laughs> and wasn't the guy they wanted to get. In order to save money for Kong, it was shot simultaneously on the same set. They were shooting another movie called Most Dangerous Game, and they were using the same props, the same sets, all of that. They wanted to use the same actors. Faye Ray is in both movies. She would sometimes be screaming for 22 hours a day, for a whole day on the thriller, and then all night with the ape. And they wanted her leading man from the day to play it at night. He just wouldn't do it. And he didn't want to do all of the jungle swinging on vines. So they found a guy that wasn't very experienced, isn't very photogenic, and just is kind of like a big ape. 
I'll say, Stuart, watching it this time, Denim was definitely my focus. That is who this movie is about, even though he's not Feyre. He is not the star. He is not Kong. But I do feel like if you're really trying to pay attention to the characters here, this is all propelled by Denim. It's, it's all about him and his lust for the ultimate movie picture, the ultimate attraction to bring people to. Yeah, keep in mind the fact that Captain Englehorn and all the crew are serving him. They're not in charge of their own mission. This director is in charge of everything. Where they're going, what is in the cargo hold. They've gone all the way into the South Seas without knowing what happens next. And if somebody pulled out a hand-drawn map and said, we're going to this thing (laughs) I heard about from a drunk sailor description two years ago, I would say, fuck you, and turn my ass around and go back to Manhattan. It was the Great Depression and the sailors needed jobs. And (laughs) it wasn't their first go, you know, that talks about how these guys were his usual boat crew to get him over there to film his dangerous movies. Yeah, 21 minutes, we finally see the movie director say, did you ever hear of Kong? And uh, that name, just incidentally, where did they come up with the name King Kong? Apparently there was a 1929 movie called King of Komodo. And again, Cooper was obsessed with the Komodo dragon and always saw that this ape was going to fight the Komodo dragon. And he just kept talking about King of Komodo, King of Komodo. And maybe because this area is not far from Hong Kong, it all just became King Kong. Yeah, you say Kong, I do think Hong Kong, which... Yeah, it takes me a little bit off guard, because I'm like, King Kong isn't Asian? <laughs> Except he is. It's this island that's going to throw you off, because it's full of Africans. <laughs> yes. And it's not called Skull Island, exactly. They say it has Skull Mountain on it. I don't believe it has a name. It's uncolonized. It's unexplored. I mean, something that was very tantalizing to all people of Cooper's generation. Can you imagine a place that no white man has ever seen before? Denham will use those words in describing his mission. They are going to go and film something no white man has ever seen. And so what has he gotten them into? I like the buildup. It feels kind of dangerous. I mean, I just like the idea and I relate to (laughs) as someone that has always been the underling to crazy, maniacal visions (laughs) of others. What is it to suddenly be, okay, I'm now on a boat headed to a mythical island that I hope it doesn't exist because if it does, (laughs) how are we going to fight something that's so big it, it needs a gate like that? And I'll say for me, you're telling me it's 46 minutes till we see Kong. I feel this movie kind of books. We're going to get to the island within, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so. And and I'm into it. I, I want to see what's going to happen. Like as they creep onto this island and there's this whole ceremony going on. We can talk about how everything's depicted, but I'm into what this movie's showing me. And I'm not. I know where we're going. That I watched the trailer. The trailer told you where you were going. You knew you were going to get a big ape. But why don't you like this as setup? You like Indiana Jones. Obviously, this is Indiana Jones. Right. I was going to also say these characters are paper thin. I don't like the characters because I feel their characterizations just don't have anything to grip me. I like characterization too. God knows I've talked many times and dinged many probably movies that people love because I didn't feel the characters were there. But we all could go with things that are archetypal. And this movie is moving along in a clip in a vernacular. Again, you don't expect deep psychological characterization from movies of this period. Why isn't it enough just to see jungle explorers going to a native village? I also don't expect deep psychological characterization from children's books, and that's why I don't read them. You like many things that are very thinly drawn, including Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is the setup for finding the idol. You should like this as much as anybody dreaming of going to a far off place and finding a landmark creature or event from the rear projected boat scenes to the lame romance that we're focusing on during this boat trip i want to get to the monkey i'm surprised you want to get to the monkey when you're not impressed by the rear projection all of this stuff is dated i'm not going to call out any of the effects because they're all dated but i like the character traits these are not characters but when we get to the island and denim's like Hand me my camera. I like, I was saying to the screen before that, I'm like, hurry, get that camera out. Start filming this whole tribal thing. He's going to wait too long. And that tells me I'm into this. Like I'm rooting for at least one character to get some footage. And I'm wondering what the hell kind of movie does he make if he can film 
a few feet of footage of some random ceremony. There's no actors. There's no dialogue. What exactly kind of filmmaking is this? Well, let me direct you to some of Cooper's other movies. His first film, Grass. Literally, it's called Grass. <laughs> and it is about Iranian tribes people who walk up a mountain to try and find grassland for their livestock. Sounds incredibly boring. It has some of the most amazing footage I've ever seen anybody ever capture on film. It is mind-blowing because he literally was there staring off cliffs, watching them do this. Denim and Cooper are the same. And this is exactly how he would have made King Kong if the studio had let him. But he would be embedded with the people with grass, right? He wouldn't be spying on them. My go-to, my my comparative with this is the movie Bowfinger, where they're filming the movie star in secret in bushes. But then at least in Bowfinger, you have actors running up and spouting dialogue and trying to give a semblance of a plot. I would completely understand his filming if he was with Nat Geo and doing a documentary. I just don't see how anybody in Hollywood is going to pay a nickel to go see this. They weren't documentaries. They were stories. He would instruct non-actors, indigenous people to become the star. And he feels like all you really need to do is show people magnificent things and the story writes itself. So yeah, Chang and was a boy and his tiger, like all of them were about taking real native people and showing their lives. And eventually a story would be found with a lot of help from the editor that didn't have some mainstream appeal. Yeah. Sometimes the enjoyment in a film is more how it came to be than the actual movie. I mean, I think about the original Mad Max. Let's just strap cameras to cars driving 200 miles an hour and crash them into something. And we'll form a post-apocalyptic movie out of that. The fun of that is just watching these cars go really fast and do really dangerous stunts. Like sometimes that is the fun in a movie. And so I could see a place for, yeah, well, grab some raw documentary style footage and and make it into a film somehow. Yeah, it's a lost art, frankly, because we've had so many years of movie making. It's an industry now. And so everyone knows what you need to do to become a movie screenwriter or a movie director. You need to follow this path and your life will be about being on movie sets. Here are people who have spent a majority of their lives just having adventure, just going to islands like this yeah, they don't always have good technique. It bugs me how often they break the 180 degree rule, which, <laughs> by the way, is like when a character walks off screen and they're going right and then they come back on screen walking in left. It's like that bothers me. You don't do that. They need to be going in the same direction. They don't always know film grammar, but they know what it is to seek and hunt down adventure. And that passion can translate and I think does here in these scenes. Yeah, I love it when Denim says, I got to film this because the last time I tried to get a shot of a rhino, the cameraman ran off. So, like, he's this controlling guy. I love that. Like, he's going to pull out that camera and start filming this ceremony. And I just want to point out, we can talk about racial depictions of these tribes people. But, again, Cooper always did try to use people from the actual locations he was in. And many of these people are black. The tribesmen that we see is from St. Louis. They darkened his complexion. Okay, it looked like it. <laughs> Dramatically, they wanted him to come off as darker skin, but he is at least a black man, and they are using real language. The censors actually wouldn't let the screenwriter make it up. They told her there might be subversive messages if you're creating your own <laughs> language, so we want you to use the real ethnographic language of tribes people from Southeast Asia. So they, I don't know if it makes total literal sense, but they've taken words and speak from tribal culture. Which is funny because Ray Harryhausen talked about how he loved this movie, learned the word said here, went to one of the islands mentioned, said those lines, and the person said in English, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> I did find it funny because this is supposedly an uncharted island. I assume they've developed language just in their own space. No one else speaks this except Englehorn, the captain of the ship. Like he's just able to walk up and communicate with them. No problem. Well, he does drop the line. It sounds very similar to this other island's language. So yeah. my litmus test is, does anyone have a bone in their nose? If you see a <laughs> bone in the nose, then you know that they're being lazy about ethnographic detail. I do feel like Cooper's doing better than most movies of the time period and depicting this, this trot. Yeah, I know Jackson's going to get a lot of stuff because he is not going to change this scene at all. But I do feel like uh, this is shot in 1933. Yeah, it's not overly bad. They used African Americans to play 
African Islanders, so okay. And sometimes Mexicans and Native Americans, but again, (laughs) at least darker-skinned people. They didn't have whitey putting on blackface. But this is perhaps one of the most racist movies I've ever seen, because growing up, a family friend would often refer to black people, a very racist family friend who I don't agree with, I want to say, but would often refer to them as gorillas. This movie is all about the black man trying to steal the white woman. It's birth of a nation with a monkey suit. Wait, halt the press here, because I would actually argue that's one of the things that's really great about this movie, is that it actually is one of the few movies of the time period to talk about what was really going on in America that no one would actually show in a Hollywood movie. Lynchings were prevalent. Scottsboro boys would have happened around the same time. Black men were accused of looking at and trying to possess white women and being lynched and killed for it. Here's a movie to actually dramatize that. That was my struggle watching it this time. I'm like, is this saying, yeah, these people came from this primitive culture and look at what they did to our civilized nation? Or is it putting some of the blame on Whitey here? Like, uh, well, Reed dragged him here. and In chains. Yeah, they wanted their freedom and they wanted to be with who they wanted to be with. I don't feel like this film is going to really moralize on that maybe it couldn't at the time maybe that would be too controversial but i do think there's things here it's hard to see which way they're trying to go with it but you could write a college paper on either side (laughs) i guess yeah i just anytime you demonize a black man for an interracial relationship and you relate a gorilla to a black man, I get sensitive about it. Yeah, but they blame the white woman for his downfall. Like, the tragedy isn't that New York was destroyed, it's that this big ape, his natural wisdom, as they'll call it out early on, was overcome by the beauty. It's not quite blaming King Kong for what's going to happen. Yeah, it may not be racist, it may be sexist. It may be that women <laughs> yeah, are the problem, true. and not dark people. I mean, yeah, but honestly, that's the thing that's interesting is, while that may be the message Cooper is telling it's because cooper can't see that he is the villain he is actually the reason for all of the misfortune he is the one that is it dangling this white one it's like putting her out there in a dress that could i say with one tug of that tassel looks like it will pop completely off (laughs) dangling essentially a naked quote-unquote golden woman in front of a native so that it can get him aroused and then dragging that ape to America to be exploited in chains, he's the villain. Again, I don't think this movie's politics are that off from now. It's just maybe it's not as woke because there's not as skillful underlying of all these themes. But to me, it's one of the few movies I can think of from 1930 that would dare to even talk about it. Because in proper society, you didn't talk about things like this. At the end, it doesn't feel like a victory that King Kong is dead. No. In fact, I think almost everyone feels like it's a tragedy. Their sympathies lie with this big ape. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's just when they're on this island and I see the tribal people and it's triggering. I can get how it's triggering and people react. I'm just asking people to take a breath, think about it a little bit and realize that there's some interesting woke ideas along with the stereotypical racial notion. And I was able to write it off. It's a very different time. Even if there are some ideas in there, their way of handling it. Today, the director would never work again. Twitter cancel culture would come in with their pitchforks and string them out much worse than we see Fay Ray strung out. And yet we will have modern day tellings of King Kong and we'll talk about how this is actually dealt with. I think that's going to be one of the interesting things about coming back to this again and again is, yeah, when these ideas come up, how do we look at the sexism? How do we look at the racial politics? That's the stuff that's keeping me sustained in the first 45 minutes of this movie. It's the reason why I'm not going. God damn it. Wake me up when the ape gets here. And I just, I do think 45 minutes is too long for the ape. I get excited when they get to the island, but then... They have to stretch it out with the going back to the boat and the kidnapping of Anne. And I think this movie, in its uncut version, runs a little bit long. Here's the original idea. As they originally conceived it for the screen, they wanted the people to get there. There was no villager. There was no dance sequence. They wanted to get there and have the sailors fight a series of dinosaurs. And that the big boss would be the ape. But that you would have action from the 25-minute mark as, hey, look, that looks like, you know, everything we're going to get after Kong, they would hold back Kong as the final thing that they would see. Does that work better for you? Not for the story that I see here. 
totally different story. Yes, then it's, I mean, it sounds very video gamey. We get better and better bosses until we get to the big King Kong boss. I just like it as whenever you see a gate that big, I mean, just those kinds of signifiers. I mean, Jurassic Park used that. We didn't see the T-Rex for a long time, but we knew from that gate, oh my God. And a fun bit of trivia, obviously in this time, that wall was a practical effect. It's what they set fire to in Gone with the Wind. When Terra is burning, that's that wall. They actually <laughs> burned it down for Gone with the Wind. Yeah, they reuse a lot of props in Hollywood. I mean, again, <laughs> you got to make your pennies stretch. But I'm with you, Stuart. I, I feel like all this buildup... Look, I know what's coming, because I've obviously seen this film a few times at this point. But when I sit down for now playing, I do try to reimagine, like, what what if this was my first time? And that often brings out new insights, trying to view it like that. And so, yeah, watching, you know, the buildup of the drums and seeing the ceremony and these giant walls. Give me a little mystery before the reveal. I'm for a little mystery. I just wish that... Maybe it's the performances, maybe it's the actors. I wish I had something to hold on to other than the spoiled-by-the-trailer mystery of the ape. Yeah, I think you have to love the tropes. The tropes have to be enough that it doesn't matter who's putting on the safari hat and walking into the potted plant jungle. I mean, you just have to love the ideas of it because you just want to be there and you want to watch anybody, doesn't matter who, do the old scenario. Everything creates mood and vibe. Mm -hmm. The soundtrack, you know, I could have thin characters playing cool hit music. I could have good sound design. I could have colorful shots. But here, everything is so old timey, including the stilted performances, which were just of the time. It's just how old movies were acted. I didn't want to go here, but I mean, to me, this is the way Star Wars comes off. The presentation feels very stilted with the old wipes and all of that. It feels like a language from a movie not from 1977. But retro is fun. I mean, I'm someone that likes steampunk. I'm someone that likes to see antiquated technology. It's fun to ride in a buggy and not a sports car. I attribute that as just a different way to paint a picture. You know, we grew up in a special effects age. We grew up in the 80s where all the movies were primarily concerned with photorealism and making it as vivid and graphic as possible. But we also grew up with music videos where the art form was to take old ways of doing things. I think of Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer, the way they use claymation <laughs> and all of that. It has a charm all of its own. It's a different way to paint the picture and the picture can still be beautiful even though it doesn't look real. The thought I had while I was watching this was if you've seen the movie Be Kind rewind and you know what a sweeted film is where you basically remake a film but instead of c-3po in a shiny robot suit you're going to build a cardboard robot suit to me there's a charm to that there's a reason why those are the best segments of that movie it's almost this childlike passion i remember being a kid and getting my dad's he had a betamax we were a betamax family wow <laughs> yes but just doing these home movies and trying to do stop motion with my toys and so when i watch old special effects films like king kong there's an innocence to it there's also just a passion like hey we're gonna make a movie about a giant gorilla we obviously don't have computers because we don't know what those are yet how do we go about doing that and moving that curtain away from where the wizard is seeing that magic happen on screen in these old kind of films I, to me there's a charm it, there's an innocence to it and there's just fun seeing how do we do this when we don't have very expensive computers to make it look realistic and it could even be better than photorealism I mean I could take your picture or I could paint it with pointillism out of a million little dots and that would probably look cooler than the photo there's more than one way to skin a cat there's more than one way to photograph an ape okay and when i say it needs to get to the ape faster i'm not complaining about special effects i did mention the rear projection on the boat and i'm saying it doesn't have that to pull me in i don't have great vistas like lawrence of arabia showing me the desert of the ocean here because it's not there and when you say there's different ways to do things. That's the difference between a craftsman and somebody with a limited tool set. Like, for example, if a child, I know I'm heartless, if a child in kindergarten gives me a crayon drawing and he colors outside the lines and it's really rudimentary, I'm not putting that up on my refrigerator, but I understand that's all the child has, that's all the skill and tools we've given him, and that's the best he can do. If I watch Deadpool, where Deadpool's entire homicidal plan is drawn just like that, I realize they're doing that for an effect. They're trying to create a specific mood. They could have done anything they wanted. They chose to do this. There's a big difference there. 
you're absolutely right. It's about craftsmanship and people can take tiny little nothing and if they're great craftsmen can make something more compelling than children that, I mean, the easy route is to be able to take modern equipment and snap the picture. Oh boy, that's nothing. But right now, we haven't even gotten talking about special effects. We're talking about a big wall, some stereotypical African tribesmen. Okay, let's talk about it then. You haven't talked about it yet. Talk about it now. Kong walks in. Are you in love? I find it cute. I actually do. I think the worst problem with it is when the stop motion people took a break for overnight. You can see the seams of when, like, they took a long break and when they come back, Kong's fur has just shifted in a frame. Oh, see, I, I love the way his fur shifts depending if the, like, animator touched it between mm -hmm. shots. Like, that's what I love about stop motion. I love the imperfection. So I'm glad that's all here. When you do these close-ups on Kong's face and it's just kind of goofy looking, that is the power of this movie. Yes, because it's old and it's in black and white, it sells that more, but that is the charm of this film i like how it's presented here i mean and again this is endured this is an art form that didn't just go away we still like stop motion jurassic park was almost done this way well, but no but i mean like we still watch rudolph at christmas time with the stop motion effects nightmare before christmas they could make it as a stage musical it wouldn't be nearly as charming as watching the stop motion puppets sometimes this is not just acceptable it's better than what can be done today. I would not want to see this vision go. There's so much personality to this ape. His grin, particularly when they cut to the head. Like most of this is a puppet being manipulated frame by frame, but they do have, they want these shots when people get eaten or whatever. They have a big ape head that three guys are inside. That smile he's got, it's so mischievous. Yes. He always looks like, <laughs> I, it reminds me of my punk. I just can't deny it. Like I'm about to do something you really don't want. I've got your shoe in my mouth. And I am going to make you get up off that couch. I absolutely find him adorable. You're right. He is absolutely instantly the most charming person in this movie. And this is where I'm going to show some of my age is that I'm old enough that I got thinking. I mean, stop motion was the thing. They made improvements in stop motion, but I find stop motion to be charming because I'm old enough that when I saw Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, even I started thinking, what are some of the last films I saw with this? I'm like, Robocop 2 had a ton of Phil Tippett stop motion. Army of Darkness. Why did they do stop motion then? It's because that's how they had to do it. As you just said, No, Jacob. stop with that lie. They didn't just not have enough money to do it right. They did it this way because it's the right way to do it. No, they did it because computers didn't exist no, until Jurassic Park. I will never be believe that you cannot believe it but that's like they not have believing. computers sometimes emulate this kind of look they do now now yeah, corpse bride was done with computers yes. to make it look like this yes and for a tim burton or something who wants to do this it is now nostalgic but the reason i like it is because when they made RoboCop 2, it's all they had. That's what I'm saying. When they made Jurassic Park, they were going to stop motion it because it was all Spielberg thought they had until ILM came in with their computers. And then guess what? Spielberg never said, yeah, let's do the cheesy stop motion. No, he said, let's make this real. I will never agree with you in your hierarchy of special effects that in improving the ability to get more photorealistic, other art forms that aren't are diminished. This is why I kind of wish we're doing Peter Jackson's remake right after this one, because I think that's going to come off different because that's going to be using the latest technology. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. I mean, look, they obviously had limited technology, but they could have done a lot of rear view projection with a guy in a giant suit, and it probably would have been laughable. We probably wouldn't be reviewing it today. Correct. That is something they could have done in 1933. It would look bad and no one would be talking about this film. If it was a man in a suit, King Kong dies in this moment. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Because Godzilla's a guy in a suit and he's endured. So I can't say that definitively. I disagree with your religious belief that that's the case. But I'll say I like the effects in this movie for what they are. They make me smile. Again, but it's, there's something so condescending about you smiling at it that way. Like, oh, that's cute. That's all you could do. I don't see it that way. And I'll never see it that way. 
This is an art form. You can paint in this style. You don't always have to make it look like movies look today. I understand it's an art form. I have done stop motion. It is a hard work thing. It takes a shit ton of time and a shit ton of talents and practice. I'm not discounting the craftsman, but you would never be able to make King Kong like this today. You just would not. Now, well, you could. Again, go back to Be Kind Rewind. They actually did sweep that film. You can see how they did it in that context. It isn't that different. I will say even, because I know we're going to Godzilla eventually here, but if you've seen the 2016 Godzilla Resurgence or Shin Godzilla, like I think they used CGI. It, it was a Japanese Godzilla film, but they also used a dude in a suit and I think enhanced it with CGI because they did realize like this is what people kind of like in a Godzilla movie. Yeah, it, You know what? It's called postmodernism. Like if you believe that all time periods are equally valid you can make steampunk you can have the idea that we can fly to the moon in a hot air balloon i love that stuff i think that's always valid to pull from antiquated ideas to create new visions i can't decide what i'm more allergic to steampunk or cats I get that you hate it, but I again, you understand my point. But I'm saying that there is something that holds up about how dated this is and cute, and I'm having fun watching the stop-motion ape. And to jump ahead, there is one effect in this movie, one, that astonished me. Because every shot here, we are too sophisticated an audience now. I mean, if you go back to The Great Train Robbery, I love this story. People didn't know movies. At the end of The Great Train Robbery, the guy shot his gun at the camera. Audiences screamed, thinking bullets were going to fly off the screen and hit them and kill them. Audiences are now more sophisticated. You shoot at the screen and say, go ahead and make my day. People aren't going to fly out the door. But back then, also, audiences weren't sophisticated enough. Obviously, they knew this wasn't a real monkey, but they weren't sophisticated enough. They didn't have the behind-the-scenes features we have today to know how it was done. Here, I'm watching this, and I'm like, matte painting, well done. Stop motion, well done. Rear projection, stop motion with matte. I'm liking all of this, but there is one shot that I'm like, how did they do it? And that one shot alone is enough to make me stand up and give them an ovation if in 1933 they can pull an effect, which is like four layers deep. You've got a person in one corner, a person in another corner, Kong in the middle, a matte painting in the back. And I'm like, how did they do that? How did they have people both in front and behind the monkey? I had to look that one up. I'm like, it turned out they were doing some kind of weird, like, the rear projection was the humans, and that's really awesome. They were creative as hell. See, and when I'm watching this, I'm impressed every time we see Kong holding a stop motion and, and then like set her down, and yeah, it's he's gonna cover up the figure, and then we're gonna pull away that arm, and then we see Fay Ray there. I don't know. It's I like I know how it's done, but I, I love it. Like I'm you're you're pulling off you're pulling it off, guys. It's 1933, and you're winning me over. And when they have the stop motion humans, is when I feel they've gone a bridge too far they're kind of rough yes <laughs> yeah those are clearly the parts that don't look too hard at look at the ape not what he's holding in his hand when he comes and collects Anne. and is that the moment when kong and Anne meet you know she's been tied up in that white dress kong comes for her and i thought kong was feeding you're making an offering he's going to eat no he, this is Bride of Kong, and now we're in a chase movie, which I'm liking a lot more than the romance boat film, and I can't believe how long it goes. I knew he would fight a dinosaur. I knew that this was basically Kong in the Lost World, where we have a titular monster, but there were going to be a lot more monsters. I didn't know all that we would see, but... Man, they just keep going and going and having monster after monster. I think the effects people worked harder on this than anybody else. I mean, most Godzilla movies are structured in this way. You wait for an hour, and then it's endless destruction and action for the second hour. And are you more into this pacing, Arnie? Because I found myself, again, I didn't have too many problems. Once we got to the island, I thought we got there pretty quick, and then there's some intrigue and mystery, and then we get Kong, and then I feel like this movie just books. I kept looking at the time, like, there's only 20 minutes left? When are we getting to New York? Like, how many more monsters are we going to fight? I'm not saying that in a bad way. Like, I was just surprised. My memory was, yeah, he fights a T-Rex, but there's a Stegosaurus that's going to show up. I don't know. There's some weird snake he's going to fight. There's just monster after monster fight in this film. I really like what's happening here. What really interests me now is the humans chase, rescuing Anne. 
I will say there is so much of this. And certain fights, I felt, went on too long. The fight of Godzilla and the T-Rex. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Godzilla gets the T-Rex down and is trying to break his jaw. And I'm like, you know, you're almost making Kong look weak at a certain point. (laughs) It felt like WWE where they had to stretch it out to a certain runtime. And I know that's not the case, but it's just what it went to. I loved it till I didn't because I became exhausted. It's very repetitive. It's monster after monster. I I not only agree with that, but I'll even hit the emphasis harder. This movie has too much action and fighting. And maybe that's me. I tend to tune out today with today's special effects. And if a sequence goes 20 minutes and it's the same people breaking the same stuff, I just don't want to consume that much of that behavior. It just is boring. I'm going to be very interested when we get to Peter Jackson's thing, because I think he saw a lot of these issues that we're pointing out, and he tried to correct them in his own way, and we'll see how successful that is. Because, yeah, there is no character development in this film. It is a monster movie, and look, on that level, it is working for me as we go from action piece to action piece. Yeah, but it's a monster movie with subtext. You can be having a dialogue in your head more interesting than the dialogue the characters are speaking because of the racial politics, the artistic pursuit, Faye Ray and what she's going to go through here. There's lots of things to think about, even though, yes, I agree, the characters themselves are not people that I would find interesting to read a biography of. I mean, when we see Driscoll and Denim and part of the other crew go after and they'll encounter the Stegosaurus and like they'll try to gas it and then they just brutally shoot it in the head. Again, as crude as this animation, like I feel bad for this dinosaur. They get some sympathy from me because it's like, here's this majestic beast and we're going to try to gas it and then its tail's going to flicker. So we just got to shoot it in the face. If they had flipped the scenes, we'd have more sympathy. The first dinosaur they meet just comes at them because it's startled. They gas it, gun it down. Oh wait, it's still alive. Let me make (laughs) sure it's dead by putting a Yes, you really hate Denim for that. But if we had had the scene with the brontosaurus before it and we had seen the way that it had come at that guy in the tree, that howl when he dies. Yeah, you might be more inclined to understand why they're so quick to shoot back. Yeah, and I think, though, if you're looking for that subtext, that is part of it. Yes, this unexplored country is a very dangerous place for us civilized white people. But look, you could get into problems where you glamorize the natives and all that. It's very complicated. But there is also like this beauty to this primitive island that we just see these people coming in and destroying now. My my issue with the brontosaur scene is brontosaurs are herbivores they're plant eaters they should not have gone on the attack and eaten the person yeah cooper doesn't know anything about dinosaurs i mean any five-year-old at the time i had tons of dinosaur books growing up like oh i love dinosaurs as a kid yeah children Mm -hmm. know the brontos are the plant eaters they knew that at that time this is just cooper not knowing again he studied real animals he wanted to talk about a real killer ape He hadn't spent any time thinking about prehistoric creatures. That said, if a brontosaur is charging at me, I'm going to shoot first and think about plants later, too. (laughs) But no, I like the people going on the adventures. I like it when Kong is rolling the logs and all those people are falling. It's hysterical to me to see them just fall one after another after another. It's very crude. It's obviously just like mannequins they're dropping down there. And I did read there is supposed to be a whole scene at the bottom of that canyon. They're falling down as Kong shakes them and they self-censored it. They just said, there's no way this is going to pass. This is too outrageous what we have planned. Jackson will pick that up in 2005. But there is something horrific just seeing these mannequins plop down to the bottom of this chasm and just die. There's a lot of death in this film. You could actually find the scene. Thanks to Weta, Peter Jackson's special effects company, they actually kind of as a fan and film went back using 1933 technology and said let's recreate it some people say they saw the movie and saw the scene but nobody that's been able to put kong out on vhs or dvd or screen it on television has found what we'll call the spider pit sequence yeah according to wikipedia it was never shot you know what ray bradbury said he saw it and o'brien the stop motion head animator said it was the best thing he ever made so contradictory testimony i tend to believe it probably was shot for some reason but partly because we never knew these sailors never care about these sailors to see five minutes of the sailors being attacked is just more creature exploitation and i don't think that this film is lacking of that in its second half we don't need more monsters killing and hurting more people it slows the pace down if you care about rescuing the female 
But he and his animators did recreate the sequence. You can find it on YouTube. It's fairly seamless. I mean, you can tell sometimes the work that they did, but you can see the footage as it was, quote, meant to be or scripted in its original form. And it does explain why those guys stay on the log. Because you're like, why don't they just go to the other side of the log if there's an ape on one side? It's because there was another dinosaur that was threatening to stab them. But T-Rex, yeah, T-Rex is a fight worth keeping. Not all of these fights are equally interesting to me, but the T-Rex throwdown and his finishing move that Kong goes for the jaw and tries to like crack it open. That's fun. Yeah. And this is where great that we have animators here, that this isn't a guy in a suit because who would have thought to like animate Kong or to portray Kong, like just playing with this broken jaw. And, like <laughs> there's something so animal like about it. It's almost chilling. Like I wouldn't call this a horror movie, but there are times where I'm like, they could have definitely played things up and it could have been like a horror movie. I just loved it. It was kind of like, you dead now? You're really dead? Okay, you're yeah. Dead. <laughs> Again, it makes him human. It makes him relatable. Makes us laugh a little. Makes us enjoy him a lot more on screen than anything we've seen before. And yeah, I think it is the animator being able to put his personality in his puppet. The wife of Willis O'Brien said, whenever I watch this movie, I see... My husband, at the premieres and at the early press junkets, she felt and many people felt that you could see the personalities coming through of the filmmakers. The director of the film is the director in the movie and the stop motion animator is King Kong. But my patience does start to wear down. Like you, I just start to think, wow, how long are we really going to have this go for? It's good animation. Yes. I don't know which one. I would cut. I do. I would cut the snake. Yeah, it's the snake. I'm like, okay, give Kong a rest. Let this guy catch his breath. <laughs> yeah. Like, how many more monsters does he have to fight? Why are they in his home? Yeah, how does he survive if he's constantly besieged on yes. this island? If he's king, <laughs> he should have these guys under his control. He should be able to have his cave, have his dinner, have his woman uninterrupted. And damn, talk about the biggest shock in this movie. I was I literally... I was scandalized with the scene in which he peels <laughs> off her dress. I cannot believe that that was conceived and shown to family audiences in 1933. I can't believe it. I was a little shocked myself. I'm like, wow, we are making it overt that this ape wants to get it on with her. I mean, he's going to sniff his finger. There's no way a modern movie. I mean, I get no, there's actually no way I can think of a modern movie making it more eroticized. I cannot. I mean, there is the shape of water. Yeah, but I mean, that felt like it was more mutual. That felt like it was more, she saw his spirit. Here, I'm just like, this is animal lust. You're saying this is one-sided, yeah. And I want to look away because this is sexual assault being sold here. And I guess I always felt like at some point... In my mind, when I thought of this movie, Fay Ray kind of fell in love with him too, that she consented. I think that's the 70s one. Okay. It's also the Peter Jackson one. That was the shock watching it this time is Fay Ray is never into this ape. Like, no. She is just screaming the entire time. And yeah, I get that she has a memorable scream and that's what they want to sell here, that Kong is terrifying. But since, yeah, we as modern day people are not terrified in the same way. And this is a slow moment. This is a moment to have an interaction with the golden bride. Yeah. What is it to be a bride of Kong? They could have done a character moment here, but it, a pterodactyl blows in and <laughs> we get a lot more stop motion. He does that finishing move again, though. I'm going to be looking for it in every Kong movie. Does he always crack open the jaw? To the jaw, yeah. And this gives driscoll a chance he was the one that didn't fall down from that log so he's been able to go and sneak into that cave as well and what they're going to try to climb down a vine into the ocean and kong's onto him but they still get away but at this point we've had about a half an hour of action or so after 40 minutes to get to kong i would honestly be okay if credits rolled at this moment i'd be like I mean, it, it is a full adventure movie. You went to the island, you went to the Heart of Darkness, you found the beast, you escaped the beast, you're back to the boat, but this movie has another trick up its sleeve, and I do think it's this extra trick that does make it a classic. Yeah, if you end it here at the island, it is some monster movie from 1933 that you can't even find today. Like, it is not King Kong until he goes to New York. And even The Lost World, which again was made eight years before, 
brought one dinosaur back from the dinosaur island to run around London. And it wasn't Pronto. Again, what do these filmmakers not understand <laughs> about herbivores? T-Rex. Always go with the T-Rex. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's the winner. He's always the one the kids like most. But yeah, we're going to have Denim use one of those Chekhov's gas bombs. He only needed one, which was a surprise. <laughs> Well, he could have blown up the whole city, remember, so he only needed one. Let's load him on the boat. I wish I'd seen that scene. <laughs> Hold that thought. There was a whole movie planned, but we'll talk about it next week. But cut, we're in New York. We got the ape there. Yeah. Actually, we're still in L.A. One of the charms I had about living in that city is you can always see places you recognize from movies. Like now, like, oh, that's really what it is. That's the Halloween house. Mike Myers' house is actually down the street from the Elm Street house. All of that kind of fun movie trivia stuff. They're not at Broadway. They're at the Shrine Auditorium at USC campus. I know it. I've seen many concerts here. Yeah, they shot a lot of this island stuff at Catalina Island just off the coast of Los Angeles. Disguised well, but uh, you can still see this stuff today. Did it have like 100 foot ceilings in there? Because I did wonder how they got Kong in this auditorium. I read that it was supposed to be Madison Square Garden at first. I could believe Kong would fit in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, it's that big. And, you know, in our mind, you know, like they walk up to the footprint and they're like, look at him. He's as big as a house. Think about that. That's not that big, right? I mean, he's 18 foot tall. By comparison, Godzilla is 50. Yeah, which is the whole reason we're going to get Skull Island, because they need a bigger King Kong. <laughs> well, the scale, I think, fluxes around depending on what shot they used. The press release put out at the time said he was 50 feet tall, and I don't know how tall he is compared to how many stories of the Empire State Building, but I think based on what they wanted it to do, they said that the bust they built, the actual articulated three-person puppet head, was scaled for 40 feet. Hmm. It sounds to me like they wanted it to get bigger and bigger as production went. When you look at what they talked about, most of the movie, he's spinning it at 18 feet. And then they definitely admitted at some point when he got to New York, they wanted him to be able to reach up and touch those elevated train tracks. They made him 24 at that point. So he's a, he's a grower, right? I mean, he's eating his vegetables. <laughs> so he grew a little bit on that boat ride to New York. Yeah. But he could get into most big movie palaces or auditoriums to be exhibited in chains. And this, they had a different take on how this was going to go. Originally scripted, they had a much more complicated story about how Kong was sold into a circus run by this female lion tamer. And she was jealous of Anne. And when Anne is asked to come out and introduce Kong to the audience, she resented the fact that Anne got more press than her. And people thought that she was more important to the story. So she put Anne in danger. She stuck her in a tiger cage. And that's what made Kong get so mad that he broke out. And here... They want to say that it's the press, the hype, that Kong just doesn't understand <laughs> flash bulbs on cameras. Most millennials probably don't either, but yes, cameras used to have to have exploding flash bulbs. I think they actually have those now on like retro things you can buy at Best Buy <laughs> just for that feel. But the way it plays, I'm not sure if it's the flash bulbs or if it's that they're taking pictures of Driscoll with Anne and they're about to be married and he's jealous. I said in my plot summary it was the flash bulbs, but I'm torn. I almost think it's a jealous rage. I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, they do say he thinks that Anne is in danger because of these flash bulbs and he's trying to save her. I don't know if it's quite jealousy. Again, it's very weird that all of a sudden Anne and Driscoll are going to get married because who cares about these two really in the relationship that hasn't been really built up at all. But I take these people's word for it that it, Kong was trying to protect Anne because that's what it seems like he's been doing this whole film. I don't know. Maybe it's just, again, my reading and what I'm paying attention to. I think he gives Driscoll some serious side eye when he's in those chains. <laughs> it has to be love or maybe lust or we can talk about definitions of love and power and rape and what have you i don't want to i don't want to have that conversation <laughs> right now but it, he's very specific it's not any golden woman would do there's tons of them in the audience later he's going to grab the wrong one and hurl her down in a horrifying moment it, that's horrific in that scene i could see why that was one of those edited scenes that got cut when it got really released at some point i could not believe that woman just like casually like being pulled out of her bed and then tossed down to the ground below i must have never seen that scene because i didn't remember it and when i saw it i was just i was stunned that got cut that's one of the best scenes in this movie because it's so stunning but yeah. yes, the censors after Hayes Code was informed. Anything that shows death was pretty much cut. Yeah, like when we let's... see 
when we see Kong rampage in the village on the island and step on people all and eat people, all that was cut. Yes. Uh. Yeah. All the good stuff. All the stuff yes. that every five-year-old <laughs> would want. They were not allowed to see when the movie was re-released in the late 30s, 40s, 50s. Well, the stuff in the jungle, it's fun because you, I mean, he's supposed to be dangerous, so you need to see kills. But when he grabs that woman and just is like, not you, and flings her down, <laughs> I mean, that is a moment. Not good enough. Yeah, that was shocking. And it's worth pointing out, Faye Ray is not a natural blonde anyway. She's wearing a wig, but I guess he's got a type, and it's specifically her, and no one else will do. And so he just wants to finish whatever he started there on Skull Mountain, and that means climbing the Empire State Building after, inexplicably, doing just some damage. I don't get the sense that Kong actually wants to hurt people, but I think that Cooper, the co-director, wanted spectacle. Yeah, you want to see Kong smash up an elevated train, don't you? Yeah, there's a story that may or may not be true about the film ran 13 reels. You know, movies get broken up into different canisters and assembled in the projector. They had 13. It was an unlucky number. And Cooper said, I've got an idea for the 14th reel, so we'll be lucky. And it was to film this subway sequence. I think Bull in a China Shop. You got this gorilla in an unknown, loud urban environment environment. It's self-defense almost, you know? It's what you would expect him to do. It's not like he can walk out and go, hmm, this is different. He smashes what he doesn't understand. I don't judge Kong for this. And you mentioned Donkey Kong. I'm thinking Rampage. Yeah, sure. I (laughs) mean, all of it, it is these moments that have, have endured. The rest of the movie, again, we've all said, I didn't even remember that way. I didn't remember it was a movie crew that discovered Kong. I always thought it was just explorers in Africa. I had no idea it was a vain filmmaker trying to find his next hit movie in Southeast Asia. And I can't believe how much Denim is willing to just shift careers. I'm a big Hollywood director. Wait, no, I'm going to be a circus guy. I'm going to just show my ape. I love the woman who's like, I can't sit this close to the front. It's not a movie, madam. It's a live show. Well, she's pissed. (laughs) I thought I was going to see something interesting. Yeah, that is cute. And again, I was surprised how often I was postmodernly reflecting on the art of movie making and how similar it was that Cooper and Denim were in their pursuits. That Cooper was trying to give Depression Era audiences the same kind of thrill that Denim here is. And the difference is Cooper is successful and and has a giant hit and this movie is going to be big, but Denim has a dead ape on his hands because New York just can't have him climbing around on buildings. Did New York in the 1930s have jets or biplanes ready to scramble in case of aerial assault? Well, keep in mind, Cooper is running TWA down the street from the Empire State Building. So the fact that, yes, it's the director that thinks, hey, let's use airplanes. And in fact, he is the guy behind the gun that takes down Kong in that shot. Like he, he director cameo, he is the one that killed Kong, not Beauty. I, it's just funny to me that the director could tell a cop, let's get airplanes, and suddenly they're there. The original intent, originally scripted, was the idea that Kong just got up there and lightning hit him. And that changes everything. That is God saying, you've gone too far, making a judgment, taking a monster out. But mankind flying a plane and shooting a creature that just was trying to be with his woman, very different sentiment at the end. Again, I want to be careful when you get into racial implications with this film. Like, what does it mean to say what King Kong is being pulled from the jungle and put in this urban environment? I could see how this could trigger people in 2019. And I'm not going to take that away from you that there's criticisms on both sides that could be made. But I do find it interesting trying to give this the benefit of the doubt. Who is to blame for this creature going on a rampage in the city? It's not him. It is not his fault. He was brought there in chains. He was doing what he would do in his environment, and it was capitalism and the white man that came and destroyed him and said, no, you got to fit in the way we want you to fit in, or else you have no place here. I think there's an interesting reading to be made here that doesn't all have to be racist racist depictions of Africans on an island. Yeah, I, I, it's not Africa, and I think there's a lot of parallel, really, between Frankenstein. Again, Frankenstein is a monster who you ultimately sympathize with because people destroy him. And it's not his fault that he was alive and living in the circumstance that put him on the path of being lynched. 
Yeah, I can't say that this moved me the way the 70s one moved me at the end with the... I got high expectations for the 70s one now because of you, Arnie. You speak very highly of it. I've never seen it. <laughs> I was four. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's about which Kong you discovered. I used to think Roger Moore was the best Bond because that was the one I knew. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, come on. You know, I get it. You were impressionable, Arnie. It's a Dino De Laurentiis film. I don't even expect to recommend it. Okay, I, I know what we're getting in <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> but I, at the time, but I did cry for Kong back then. Here, because of the biplanes, I find it cool looking that you got the biplanes and him swiping at them. I feel really worried for Anne that she's going to fall off. I mean, how do you get down from that height on the Empire State Building? There's a ladder right there. And I'm watching this with Marjorie. Marjorie's like... Why didn't you just climb down the ladder? I'm like, because there's a giant ape there. You're afraid to move. Yeah. And again, uh, what did she want? She ends up being very much a prop, something in the background. You really don't want to look at the people shots when you're watching the stop motion characters. It's all about watching Kong fall. And again, I will dispute it then and now. Like, it is not beauty that killed that beast. It's greed. It's greed that killed that beast. The fact that he says it wasn't the airplanes. I'm like... No, quite literally, it was the airplanes. Tis beauty killed the beast. No, it's, that would be Kong committing suicide. Like, I can't have you, so I'm going to go jump. <laughs> but early on, they describe the plot of the movie that Denim wanted to shoot and is about this primitive creature putting aside its wisdom because it's just fallen head over heels for this beauty. And so I could see, you know, in that metaphorical way, yes, he is put a, to the side his instinct. Like, let's climb. Why would you climb the Empire State Building? There's no getaway route there. Like, he was overcome by this beautiful creature, and he forgot who he was. I mean, it goes back to Genesis. Women tempt men to do bad things and fall from grace. I'm just thinking Denim is spinning the narrative for his own movie. No. It's, I mean, remember when the press were there? He's like, that's your angle, boys. He's telling the press what to write and so he's spinning the angle because i think he's still gonna have a movie here yeah that's why i find him to be the most interesting character because he is the cause of all of the problems and he doesn't even realize it in the final moments his narcissism is such that he's just thinking about the show is over and so i guess it is so jacob stewart do you recommend 1930s king kong Jacob. Yeah, I came in kind of expecting to make a homework call on this one. Like, oh, yeah, it's important for these reasons. But I found myself genuinely entertained coming back to this. And again, the last time I saw this was about 15 years ago when the Jackson film came out. I rewatched this because they were playing it on TV. But yeah, I really had fun watching it. I felt it was pretty fast paced, especially for those old films. Especially, You know, you think black and white. Oh, that's just the pacing's going to be slow. I have a lot of biases when I put it on an old movie. What to expect. I got to adjust the way I judge a film because they were different times but I felt this one it's a fun jungle action movie there's not a whole lot of characters there but I love when we finally get to Kong and we get to see that animation and just the identity and the character that the animators put into him whenever it does a close up to his goofy smile with that giant head to yeah him playing with the jaw of some T-Rex that he just killed there's a lot of entertainment here and I think there are things to mine if you want to go the for the subtext here there are things there more more than just racism. I think there are interesting things that can be found in here because, yes, this is about a filmmaker going on this journey and, and destroying society. Like, is this anti-art? Is it pro-art? There's a lot of ways it could go, but I don't feel like this is homework. I feel like this movie, yes, it's dated the effects. It's dated the acting and the way it's shot, but I still find it an entertaining film. One that moved very quickly again, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, I give this one a, a strong recommend. Stuart. Yeah, you know, it's worth pointing out that we've lost a lot of films from the 1930s. Credible directors, big hits, things that at the time won awards and were considered important, were put in canisters and mildewed and rotted, and they just, they don't even exist anymore. A lot of them catch fire, you know, there's a flammable chemical, and I went to the Library of Congress where they keep them, and they have to keep, like, only five films in a stone vault just in case they, they literally spontaneously combust. Absolutely. And it's a testament to the fact that Kong was deemed so important that he's always been preserved. He was always brought back out. He was always been in the public sphere. He has never not had a moment in the sun. We have always loved him. We have always wanted to keep hold of him. But why is that? Are we sentimental? Is he our granddad and we just like to hear the old stories about the old days? Or does he have something to say about us now? 
I tend to think the latter. If this movie were just a record of what visual effects were like 86 years ago, I would say go watch the last 10 minutes and you're done. You don't need to watch this movie. I think that despite the fact that this ape never talks, thank God, (laughs) Kong has a lot to say about who we are then and now. First and foremost, it's a Depression era fantasy. I mean, think about being in abject poverty and watching the biggest building of all time being built and watching this poor creature that comes from nothing. The aspirations of thousands of Okies on his back when he climbs up there and is saying, just for a moment, I'm king of the world. And yeah, lots of, we've already talked about the cultural readings of racial politics and female exploitation. For me, I find that it's really mostly about the madness and hubris of the creative process itself. I find Denim really, really compelling. I'd really like to see how he's going to be portrayed in the later movies, whether he is more villainous or dangerous or repentant, frankly. But yeah, what extremes do you go to to find beauty? And to exploit beauty for your greed is a question I always find interesting and incredibly relevant then and now. So, yeah, the T-Rex fight is good. I mean, I do think that the special effects, if you can adapt to their primitive quality, you're going to have a good time. It's a little monotonous. I don't love it. I wish it were shorter. I'd do a fan edit myself. But yeah, I recommend the experience. And I liked it a whole lot more than I expected to. I expected to think of it mostly as homework. And I think it's a good movie. I'll agree with you. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would, and I expected to think of it as homework. I really did. Effects homework. King Kong homework. Where did it all come from? I don't believe, for myself, I'm ever satisfied just watching the remake. That's why we do retrospective series here. That's why I've never seen Peter Jackson's film. It's because I want to see where it came from. My interest in remakes is not only what does this film tell me, but how does it adapt? How does time change? That is my personal intellectual fetish, is seeing how remakes and sequels and everything change and why I must start at the beginning and must finish at the end. That's my joy, is to see that change. So I thought this would be King Kong homework. What is it that Peter Jackson was looking at and saying, all right, we need to update this so modern people will watch it. And for the first 20 minutes or so, yeah, I was happy how fast they got out of New York, but the dialogue, the characters, they're just of a different time. This is how films I've seen of that time usually are with the kind of performances given. It's not that they're bad. It's that this is what audiences at the time were used to seeing when they went to films. But today we expect what we consider to be more natural. But maybe 50 years from now, we're going to look back on these films and be like, wow, I can't believe they're so melodramatic. So I firmly expected homework, but once Kong shows up, I was surprised how much fun I have. I'm cooler on this film than either of you are, and I think it is just because of the time and because I think everything in this runs too long. I wonder if the, like, censored cut would be the one I'd like most. They cut out all the best parts, though. No, yeah, I, that for that reason. I, the stuff you'd want cut are just, like, an extra scene on the boat. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't need Charlie the Cook cutting potatoes. Exactly. I'd cut some of the stuff with the extra people on the boat, although Charlie the Cook coming back later on was kind of funny. And I'd cut the snake scene, and I'd cut down the T-Rex fight just at the very end to give Kong a more triumphant ending. But... I enjoyed watching this as entertainment as well as intellectual stimulation. It's not the highest of recommends. I'm not going to stand up on top of the Empire State Building and scream, you gotta see it, but it's a recommend. Yeah, if you care about history and not just film history, I think that it's very revelatory about the times then and how those times reflect now. I mean, I think that is the value of history is to be able to look at perspectives and how they might be influential or archaic today. But while we all know that Kong is still with us, I don't think many people know he had a son. (laughs) Yeah, I know nothing about this next film. (laughs) I want to know how Fay Ray gave birth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was the deleted scene the Hayes Code must have imposed that they've never found the footage of. It wasn't just fingering Kong was doing. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. I do not know about Son of Kong. I can't imagine anything about him will live up to the reputation of his father. But that makes me kind of like him, too. Let's see what he can do. Maybe it's unfair to judge him by those standards. We're going to find out. We 
really being as cute as Godzilla's little baby version of itself? I <laughs> love Godzuki, so yes. Godzuki, there yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with it. If that's what it is, blow your smoke rings and let's go next week. <laughs> and in the meantime, we will continue to look at a modern ghost tale. The Grudge hits its third American installment. Remember this one coming out? Direct to video? <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, no. It's a little bit of Son of Juwan, isn't it? It couldn't be quite good enough to join Sarah Michelle Geller in the movie theater. It did go straight to tape, but hey, there are people in it you know. Shawnee Smith from Saw franchise and a surprise cameo from Star Trek Next Generation. I'll leave it there. <laughs> so that will be this Friday. And also, if you want to hear some of our earlier bonus shows, we did a Cyber Monday sale. But in case you aren't following us on social media, and why aren't you following us on social media? You're missing out on things like this. But we have extended the Cyber Monday sale. It's now going to be the Cyber Week sale through Friday, where you can get some of our older donation podcasts through Podbean. Most are $2 or under. Some are as low as a dollar. And if you want to subscribe and get the whole back catalog, plus everything we do for the next year, that's hundreds of podcasts, about 300 podcasts. Normally, that's a $600 a year subscription. Cut it in half for Cyber Week, $300 for 300 podcasts. Hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I definitely think that, yeah, there are some very deep shows buried in the vault that I'm very proud of. I wish more people could hear. So maybe you can be one of them. Yeah, it's amazing to me to think how many years ago we did Return of the Living Dead or 28 Days Later or even Psycho. I mean, it's hard to believe Psycho was like our third donation drive way back in 2011. So there are over 250 bonus podcasts. Everything except the current donation drive is discounted. And it's just through Friday. We'd appreciate your support and... Hope you find some good podcasts while you're out there. And we thank everyone who has supported the show so far. Next Friday, we're going to be getting back to a retrospective that has been on ice for, boy, I thought it was coming out summer of last year, but it took a whole lot of special effects artists, a whole lot of time to de-age Al Pacino and Robert De Niro so they could look like young men for The Irishman. This is Martin Scorsese's take on Jimmy Hoffa, starring two of the most celebrated Italian-American actors of all time in all ages. It is a special effects picture just like Kong. These guys will be playing old men. They'll be playing middle-aged people. Since we did that Al Pacino series of gangsters, we're connecting it to that gold level of 2018. And if you were a part of that, you'll get the show. If you want to hear it and you weren't a part of that, please consider getting up those podcasts. I really love many of those movies, and you can learn about The Godfather and Scarface. They are available for purchase. Yep, all over on our Podbean page. So thank you for listening to King Kong. We will be back next week with Son of Kong. And Jacob Stewart, thank you for joining me. Thanks for listening to Now Playing, The Eighth Wonder of the World. He's going home. I think he's had enough of what we call civilization. Thank you for listening to this now playing podcast movie review. It's no use. The show, it's over. It's done. I'm done. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Holy mackerel, what a show. If you enjoyed this show, please tell others. You can help us out by leaving us a five-star review on Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, or your other podcast store of choice. Word will get out. It always does. Want to hear more reviews like this one? You can find hundreds of other movie reviews at our website, nowplayingpodcast.com. Switch it on, like this, and you'll get them by matching. In our archives section are over 800 reviews. Listen to our hosts discuss horror, sci-fi, comedy, action, drama, and more. Plus, you can hear reviews of every movie based on Marvel or DC Comics. Why don't those candy asses in New York hear about this one? A new, totally free movie review podcast is posted every Tuesday. So come back each week for another new show. This island is just the beginning. There's more out there. What do you mean, more? 
This world never belonged to us. It belonged to them. The question is how long before they take it back. Kong is not the only king. Now playing relies on listener support to keep operating. Do you suppose he knew he was saving my life? Do you suppose he knew he was helping us? Of course not. You want me to believe he was grateful? You can support Now Playing by joining our Podbean crowdfunding campaign. Backers can get early access to reviews, unedited reviews, exclusive shows not available anywhere else, and more. Details are at nowplayingpatron.com. I am a realist, and I need you, so I am going to be generous. I will let you go without a bit of trouble and with lots of cash. At our Podbean site, you can also support the show by listening to any of our donation shows. Series like Planet of the Apes, Jurassic Park, Phantasm, Jaws, and others are available for a small, one-time contribution. I'll give you another thousand to leave right now. You haven't given me the first thousand yet. You can also donate to us directly on PayPal. Details can be found by clicking the banner at the top of our website, nowplayingpodcast.com. You might as well settle up. You gonna pay me? I'm not gonna stiff a friend. Want 375 more Now Playing reviews? Get the Now Playing book, Underrated Movies We Recommend. Arnie, Stewart, Jacob, and Marjorie reviewed 125 different movies, each getting three recommends, or not recommends. There was still some mystery left in this world, and we could all have a piece of it for the price of an admission ticket. The ebook is available now, and the print book will be shipping soon. Find details at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash book. Well, it better be good after all this valley. You can also follow Now Playing on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. There, the hosts post new episode announcements, movie reviews, and contests, where you can win movies and soundtracks. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube for original video content. She could be hysterical, so come on, follow me. Now Playing Podcast is produced by Arnie Carvalho. I'm someone you can trust. I'm a producer. Believe me, I am on the level. No funny business. Associate produced by Jason Latham. Sure, no, I've been a big help. Now Playing is edited by Stephen, Heath, and Arnie. All right, on deck! Everybody on deck! Everybody on deck! Now Playing credits read by Brock. I can't tell when I'm talking or when I'm not talking. You're talking. Am I? Yes. I'm talking? Yes. Your mouth is moving. The opinions expressed on Now Playing are those of the individual hosts and may not reflect the opinion of Venganza Media Incorporated. If you feel it, you say it. It's really very simple. Venganza Media Incorporated is not affiliated with and this podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by any entity that created the film analyzed herein. You can't accuse me. You wasn't there. All movie clips and music included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. We must not panic. If there is one thing we cannot afford at this time, it is hysteria. Now Playing Podcast is an exclusive trademark of, and may not be used without the expressed written permission of, Venganza Media Incorporated. You need to listen to us! We're not at war, Colonel. You're making a mistake. Your lies got my men killed. And you're going to get us all killed. No, no, fight. Whose side are you on, Captain? Now Playing is a Venganza Media production, copyright 2019. And no part of this show may be reproduced, repurposed, or redistributed without the written permission of Venganza Media Incorporated. All rights reserved. Why'd he do that? Climb up there and get himself cornered. The ape must have known what was coming. What does it matter? Airplanes got him. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. I don't know it, many people alive that were there to have seen the movie when it came out in 1933. Would you like me to go get Jean? We could get her on the mic. I kind of. I, <laughs> but do you think she would have gone? She doesn't strike me as an ape woman. You're really going to do it. Yes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I said legendary, folks.
<laughs> Gonna get some tales about the depression. Yeah, that's what I fear we're really opening about up. Penny candy. Like, yeah, I remember. And then, like, yeah, it will be a digression <laughs> that we will have to um, find a way <laughs> to end. I don't know what would work. Hi, buddy. Speaking of beasts, <laughs> you are kind of like Son of Kong. You're short, you're white, and you're ferocious. <laughs> And no one respects you. Yep, that's my crotch. You got it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Is she coming? Okay. Did she ever see it? I'll, I'll... She said she remembers it very, very well. Okay. Uh, From going to the movie theater. She might have seen it in the movie theater. If she did, she would have gone with some friends of hers that she hung out with at that time. And she remembers King Kong going, ah, and swinging branch to branch. Okay. Mm. So, that, so that's... Okay, so Tarzan. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Is that before or after the Martians invaded and shot up the cornfield and every 30... Maybe a tornado came as well and whisked the ape back to Oz? Exactly. But she she kept saying, I remember it very well. Mm. Did you see it? I might have. (laughs) I actually feel the same way. She was 13. She's 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't... Her memory is, you know, she can... I'm not going to argue. I don't remember every movie I saw. At the, wait, I kind of do. Mm. <laughs> he might remember Did better. Did you see it? We can have release. Yeah. We need to know. It's probably what was the audience say, like? <laughs> movies and yeah. entertainment were probably not the same focus. But none will go with his dangerous filming techniques. Dangerous? I like that term. We're going to use it. Is that when you put a woman in peril? <laughs> I mean... It's when you stand in front of a charging rhino and don't move, and the cameraman runs for the sh- to get away from the rhino, and you demand he takes the shot. I thought you said dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's what. A, I could be wrong. I thought you're doing a pun. I know. I thought you, yeah. 